We'll get started in just a minute. We'll get started in just a minute. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for Where We're Going. This series explores this point in time and how the work happening on Notre Dame's campus relates to and impacts the US and the world at large. My name is Mary Scott, and I'm the Alumni Education Programs Director here at the Notre Dame Alumni Association. Today, we're talking about sports, and our guest speakers are Notre Dame faculty and administrators. We will discuss everything from stadium design to human performance to compliance and some of the work that's happening in Notre Dame athletics. If you have questions for our guest speakers, please use the Google form that we're sharing with you now. And now I'd like to welcome our moderator for today's discussion, our colleague and friend, Chris Stevens. Chris is a 1974 graduate of Notre Dame. He's an assistant teaching professor in the Mendoza College of Business founding co-director of the Inspired Leadership Initiative here at Notre Dame and the founder of CS74 Ventures. Many of our guests might be familiar with his previous role as the Vice President of Corporate Relations and Customer Development at Keurig Green Mountain. But what they might not know is that Chris played basketball here at Notre Dame and he actually scored the first two points of the Digger Phelps era in 1971. Additionally, he was on the team that ended the UCLA's 88 game winning streak and was part of the only Notre Dame men's basketball team to be ranked number one during a season. After graduation, Chris also played professionally in Europe and was on the Belgium championship team. Chris now teaches the sports management course in Mendoza. Chris, that's quite a sports background that you have. Before I turn the discussion over to you, I wanted to ask a little bit about the sports and the coronavirus. Earlier this week, the NBA just finished a really successful bubble. What are your thoughts on how sports in general have handled the pandemic and the interruptions that the coronavirus presented? Thanks, Mary. It's a pleasure to be with you all. You know, sports has played such a major role in society, touching the lives in so many different ways, both from an amateur level and a professional level. Think about it, you know, entertainment, the thrill of competition, overcoming adversity, teamwork, discipline, wellness, pride. The list is almost endless. The current pandemic has caused major interruptions in many sports, but some like football, baseball, hockey, basketball, tennis, golf, they found a way to isolate players sufficiently to be able to compete in front of very limited or no crowds at all. Some are playing in billion dollar plus facilities that bank on the spending power of fans for tickets, memorabilia, merchandise, food and beverages. 
seeing car races and horse races run in empty facilities designed to accommodate hundreds of thousands of spectators seems almost surreal. For viewers online, they get the benefit of piped in crowd noise that makes it seem as if the facilities are full. So what does that mean for the future of sports facilities? Yet at the amateur high school and youth level, many sports and seasons have been canceled. What impact will this have long-term on those who are now shut out from competing? High school seniors who lose scholarship possibilities and more, psychologically, physically, emotionally, this pandemic has taken a toll. And to schools that rely on the revenue generated from sports, how will this impact their ability to function in the future? Young men and women in high school who dream of playing in college have major challenges before them to realize their aspirations. Moreover, we live in a world whose conscience has been jolted by the reality that there remains in many elements of society, racism, sexism, and prejudice. The senseless deaths of people like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor demand that we re-examine our priorities, policies, and prejudices. Leaders in the professional sports world have been at the vanguard in the demand for change, but can those efforts be sustained and drive real change? Will women and minorities ever get their fair share of opportunities for leadership positions as coaches, general managers, and owners? We hope to address these topics and more over the next three weeks from three different perspectives. This week, we have three prominent Notre Dame faculty and administrators to provide their insights. Next week, we'll have three leaders from the world of sports in the United States. They'll share their views. And finally, we will have three people who have or who have had leadership roles in sports outside the United States. Our distinguished panel today will seek to address these issues and more over the course of the next 15 minutes. And we're thrilled that you have chosen to join us this week as we shed some light on just where are we going in the world of sports. So let's meet our panel. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through their most impressive bios as you can see them on ThinkND and we've already emailed them to you. But I'm pleased to introduce first, Philip Bess, professor of School of Architecture, Kara Okabach, Assistant Professor in the Department of Anthropology in the College of Arts and Letters, and Angie Terrain, a Senior Associate Athletic Director for Culture, Diversity, and Engagement in Notre Dame Athletics. Welcome, Philip, Kara, and Angie. We're delighted that you could join us today. So I'd like to kind of begin by just taking things from a 30,000 foot perspective and gain your thoughts on just where you think we're headed overall, looking through the lens of a pandemic worldwide that shows little sounds of abating. Kara, your thoughts, please. Yes, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Chris. Uh, So there are a couple of different ways to look at this and I wanna preface it by saying myself and a colleague uh, from CUNY Brooklyn did a study over the summer looking at the impact that COVID has had on everybody's exercise routines and how that affected uh, perceived physical and mental health during this time where gyms were shut down and people were told to be isolated as much as possible. Uh, And just from that study, uh, we found that people were suffering a great deal. Uh, Stress levels increased, mental health got worse, physical health got worse. Uh, And these were adults and You can only imagine how people who are relying on sports and exercise as not just a form of being well, but also as a form of really important social networking. If that's happening to adults, what's happening to our youth who are still going through social development and psychological development, where all of a sudden many of their outlets and many of the ways in which they're able to interact with their friends and the world have been removed. Uh, And so we are, We are learning how to be much more creative in our ways of being athletic and getting into sports. And just as the NBA and NHL have shown, this can happen, but it's going to be happening in a very different manner than what we are used to. And we hope this is not the new normal, uh, but it's entirely possible that we are going to have to adapt in in a great many ways to this new reality. Thanks, Carol. Angie, your thoughts? Yes, I, I totally agree with Kara that we, we definitely is made us have to adapt and be flexible. It's even challenged, challenged us to start thinking about the long seasons that we've had, right? How do we shorten seasons now so that we can have sports and, and have participation? Because it is so important to our society. It is a thing that gives us the 
normal that we're, we're seeking when the, I remember the first NFL game that was on TV. And I remember saying to my husband on that Sunday, this kind of feels normal, right? So if we need this for our, our mental stability and our health stability, um, we will have to be flexible. We, we will have to be more creative in what those seasons look like. But also now we're really, really concerned about safety and how do we do it in a safe way? Yeah, thanks, Angie. Philip, your thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I think in terms of um, uh, in, in the long term um, that I'm imagining that um, outdoor participatory sports among children uh, and among young adults um, will continue just because they occupy such an important um, role in, um, you know, in our lives. Uh, and um, maybe even growing more important, um, but of course also with certain safeguards involving things like testing and self quarantines, um, that uh, adaptability that's been uh, mentioned. And then at least in the case of baseball, um, becoming, uh, and, and at the scale even of young people, becoming more local and involving less travel, um, certainly at the scale of youth baseball, perhaps even um, at the major league level. Um, one of the appealing things about the shortened uh, Major League Baseball season this year has been teams playing in their particular geographical regions and not encountering the good teams from the other divisions until the postseason, um, which even though it's making a, a virtue of, out of necessity is something that um, that I kind of like. The alternative models would seem playing entirely in a fanless bubble or the NFL kind of doing what they always do, traveling longer distances and playing every week, but also playing in, in fanless venues. And then how long any professional sports team can go without stadium generated revenue um, is a separate issue, but, it, but an uncontained pandemic virus that's especially lethal to the non-athletes above a certain age, I think does not bode well for the stadium revenue models that we currently have. Um, and uh, finally, needless to say, this will, this will likely have some significant effect upon big time college sports in ways we're um, not now fully able to anticipate, but the possible outlines of which we're surely already starting to see. So, Philip, you've written about American baseball parks and their historic relationship to cities and had occasion to direct guerrilla counterproposal designs for neighborhood baseball parks, most prominently in your mid-1980s project for a new White Sox ballpark in Chicago, subsequently documented in City Baseball Magic, followed later in 2000 by your work in Boston with the organization Save Fenway Pack. Uh, these proposals are today regarded in, as, by many as superior to what was actually built in Chicago and being proposed in Boston in terms of their scale, cost, economic impact, relationship to their neighborhood, et cetera. But most importantly, on more suburban sites, SunTrust Park in Atlanta, Globe Life Park in Texas, more recently, some over a billion dollars and the new Las Vegas Raiders football stadium came in at over $2 billion. So do you see this kind of trend continuing and what do you believe it will take to get fans to return and fill those seats? Well, I would say that if current stadium trends continue, um, what it will take to um, fill these venues are fans with a whole lot of money, um, which means not a lot of middle-class fans in the seats, uh, even presuming that we can actually restore a, a sizable middle class. In the absence of that middle class, I can imagine two scenarios. Um, one is that stadiums become an exclusive domain of a kind of wealthy de facto ruling class, a sort of oligarchic aristocracy. Um, in this scenario, televised sports become the way in which non-wealthy fans will experience professional sports uh, with a certain, uh, I imagine a certain combination of happy entertainment uh, and um, also increasing class resentment. Um, alternatively, the second scenario is that the economy um, of professional sports begins to shrink uh, and that professional athletes become mere well-paid heroes instead of fabulously wealthy gods um, and a little bit more like ordinary people. Um, and also that owners uh, either choose or are encouraged or are required, uh, perhaps by things like the revocation of Major League Baseball's exemption from antitrust laws, uh, to become better citizens with respect to the economics of their local community. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Angie, Kara, any thoughts that you've got on the subject? Please, please uh, feel free to chime in. So Angie, you were appointed to the newly created position of Senior Associate Athletic Director for Culture, Diversity, and Engagement. Can you share with us how Notre Dame is addressing the challenges of racial and social injustice today 
And what do you think the sports world in general can do to help create a playing field where all men and women are treated equal? Yes, um, I didn't say this before, but I, I want to start by saying thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me um, on this call. And I'm, I'm so excited to be with this group um, to talk about, talk about these issues. Um, from a diversity standpoint, our athletics department had already, we had already had like a diversity and inclusion council and had been going strong for three years, but we were doing it with individuals who were, and still are, who volunteered because this was a space that was dear to them and wanted the athletics department to, to, to continue to grow and get better in it. Um, but with the George Floyd and other issues, it came apparent to us through our own reactions and our student athlete reactions that we weren't doing enough. And so we didn't want the opportunity to pass us by. So we said, you know what, we're gonna put some intentionality behind this. We're gonna have a group of, and, and one person lead in this, in, in this area. And so that's where um, my role came about. But we started with acknowledging that, that we had some challenges and some issues that we weren't, I won't say that we, we didn't know, but just hadn't put some action towards it. So once um, our athletic director reached out to our staff and to our student athletes and said, you know what, we failed you, right? We haven't been putting focus on something that is dear to all of us and, and the Catholic mission of the university. So we laid out like our AD like laid out six things that we would, we promised we would do this year, which is to listen, to amplify our student athletes voice, to engage, um, to vote. So we've spent the past, oh my gosh, two months just vote, um, working to get all of our student athletes uh, registered to vote. Well, it's pretty and powerful. And set up education around that. I'm sorry, I think you kind of broke up there. So it's pretty powerful to see. Oh, please, Angie. Oh, can you hear me? I can now. Okay, so sorry. So um, anyway, so we, we did the voter registration piece and then um, have done some conversations on Black Lives Matter with our own um, Notre Dame associate uh, professor, uh, Dr. Richard Pierce. Um, we did some, our, our SAC has created their own subsection of Stand Together. So our teams have rallied around this and are, are creating actionable items to affect the areas that are most important to them. Um, with think, regards to your, yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I think we all took some pride in terms of um, the rally that was held on the Irish Green led by Dalen Hayes and the football team and, and Coach Kelly, you know, making a statement that we all need to do better. And it starts with each person individually. And then we, we as a team really stepping up. Absolutely. I think that got us really going and got our student athletes thinking that it was time for them to use their voice in this area. And so our job is to help them, help them do that. Um, to the second piece of your question with regards to what do we need to do to make sure that, you know, there's gender equity and, and equity for all. And it's keep talking about it, keep pushing it. Um, I think Coach McGraw was the best, you know, leader in this area to, to start these conversations. And so the more we talk about it and then put some action behind it, I think it, we continue to, um, we continue to get there. When we stop talking about it, when it doesn't become um, in everything, in, part of everything we do, then we won't, we won't get there. Yeah, I think it was Lou Holtz that had the quote one time, when all is said and done, more is said than done. Yeah. So the action is gonna speak louder than anything here. Kara. Can I add a piece onto that? Yeah, um, I love the point of, of action speak louder than words. And I think talking about it is critical. And it also uh, leads me to you know, discuss, especially with gender inequality in sports, that the science isn't there for women in sports the way it has been for men in sports. Uh, when you look at exercise physiology and biomechanics, the vast majority of the work is done on male participants and more often than not white male participants. And so we need to start funding and supporting research done among women by women in, in the fields of exercise science. Yeah. Philip. So it's a it's a small point in in what's obviously a really um, larger complex uh, issue, but but I think with respect to um, athletes being um, uh, sort of feeling better in their their participatory framework, I think that one obvious obvious way is for better friendships um, among teammates, and um, uh, you know fortunately this is this is something that tends to occur naturally 
anyway, um, I think at least on well-coached teams, right, where everyone on the team, uh, if they're well-coached, they have an understanding of their own role um, as a starter or a sub, and they're prepared to contribute at a moment's notice, right, to the common objective that they share as a team and in the, in the context of which they realize both the team's good and their own good. Um, and I, but I, I want to say that, you know, it seems to me that the that uh, the foibles of sinful human nature notwithstanding, that, that sports, certainly at least team sports, um, even though that you know, by their very nature, they're a kind of meritocracy, um, these days um, are, um, I think, more accessible, or, or at least appear more accessible um, uh, in both men's and women's sports uh, to persons across race, religion, and class. And, and that there's something about the nature of team sports that allow for uh, genuine friendships to um, uh, you know, be fostered and to thrive in that environment. Um, and you know, we can only hope that, that, that's, uh, that that's a more common thing rather than a less common thing. Great. Kara, you are quoted as saying, human biology and culture are deeply integrated. You cannot understand one without the other. We need to apply the same integrated approach to studying sports and human performance. Otherwise, we cannot hope to reach our full potential athletically. What kinds of impact do you believe this pandemic is having on the lives of amateurs and youths psychologically and physically? Yeah, I, I, I fear that at this point, the, the impact is immeasurable, especially the long-term impact. It's going to be very hard to predict how this pandemic is not only going to play out, but how it plays out on an individual level for each person. Um, Psychologically, as I alluded to before, just the sheer fact of shutdowns and stay at home orders and, you know, various social venues no longer being accessible to everybody, that's going to definitely harm the, the social and psychological development of, of, of children and um, adolescents in that critical age where developing social bonds and learning key social skills is now being eliminated or only done through screens like we are doing now. Uh, and then I can't say this is more concerning, but at least equally concerning the physical, actual health impact of, of COVID-19 uh, for those who have been affected. We are seeing long-term consequences even over the course of months, and we have no clue what this might mean much further out for people who have been aff infected. What is it going to look like 10, 20 years down the line? And as we have seen reports among football players at other universities uh, showing evidence of cardiomegaly, heart enlargement due to COVID-19 infections. So this could also be, you know, a career ending uh, disease, much less, you know, just the pandemic uh, going on. So there are a number of psychological and biological factors, and it's going to take a great deal of research uh, to really try to understand what's going on and if these sorts of damages, bodily damages can actually be reversed. Yeah. Angie, Philip? Uh, just say, I mean, that's a, that's a, you know, that, that uh, we really, um, don't really understand uh, exactly how this virus is working. And so a lot of, uh, I mean, we're in this situation where statistically um, a lot of people seem to recover and just go on with their lives, but not everybody. And it doesn't even fit quite too much of a predictable pattern, right? So that even, even apparently healthy people, you know, will, will uh, react to it, you know, in, in uh, you know, in very adverse ways. It will yeah. have a very adverse effect. So it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a bit of a mystery requiring a lot more research. Yeah, and I would just add, just from the impact that it just had has, has had on our teams, you know, you, you bring in freshmen who, you, who are looking to come and start to bond with, you know, their, their class or their, their um, teammates. And because of COVID, we're, you know, we're doing slow movements into big groups and all the testing protocols. And it just brings anxiety. And there's this whole piece of, we don't want to go home. <laughs> so how do we do what we need to do to make sure we don't go home and then have a season? And I, I think, you know, not to mention those student athletes from last spring who missed a season right. altogether. So they're here and there's that anxiety hanging over them that, okay, come this spring, will I lose another season or will I actually get to play? And what do I need to do to putting that pressure on yourself to make sure you're doing what you need to do so that you don't affect, infect your class, your teammates and things of that nature. So it's just so much more that we have to think about that we didn't, yeah. you know, a year ago. Let me shift gears a little bit. Um, Phil, the, the, the Battle of Chavez Ravine refers to the controversies surrounding government acquisition of land largely owned by Mexican-Americans on Los Angeles and Chavez Ravine. 
this 10 year period from 1951 to 1961 was often violent as the community was forced to relocate. And this site was ultimately where the Los Angeles Dodgers constructed their stadium. What takeaways from this incident in history are most influential on your work? It's a really interesting question. I, I, I grew up in Southern California or spent a large part of my childhood in Southern California and going to games at Dodger Stadium. And I really knew nothing about the um, about the um, uh, circumstances of, of the Battle of Chavez Ravine until uh, until much later. Um, I think what's of interest in, in my own um, work is that uh, Dodger Stadium was really the first pure suburban stadium. Um, and the, the politics of ballpark architecture uh, have followed similar lines in, in many places since, uh, where there are issues of urban renewal uh, or, or instances of urban renewal that, that, uh, that generally disproportionately targeted properties that were um, uh, occupied by, by minority com uh, communities. Um, there's property condemnation that takes place on behalf of privately owned sports teams, although that's not originally what happened uh, in, in Chavez Ravine, but that's, uh, but the, but the Dodgers wound up being the beneficiaries of, you know, of, of, um, you know, of, of that property, uh, even though they privately, it was the last privately constructed stadium for about 30 or 40 years. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, but, but this pattern uh, was very much involved in the creation of the, uh, the new stadium for the Chicago White Sox uh, on the south side of Chicago that, that displaced, um, you know, a pretty much an entire neighborhood uh, that was sitting on the site that, uh, that uh, the new Comiskey Park now guaranteed right field uh, uh, occupies. So um, from over, over the years, sort of, you know, thinking about that and observing how all of that worked, uh, and in the projects that I've been involved in, I've, I've arrived at um, a, a sense of, of how these things ought to work, um, which is that there really should not be any uh, takings of, uh, of private property for, the f for publicly funded private enterprises, um, yes. sports enterprises. And, and then that's, this has a couple of consequences then too in terms, in terms of uh, how you approach uh, uh, placing ballparks uh, in neighborhoods or ballparks in existing neighborhoods, which has been the focus of my work. So that one is that in terms of urban design, uh, uh, entailing both baseball parks and the adjacent um, mix of housing and retail, is that for baseball parks, they should be developed within existing networks of streets and blocks, mm -hmm. such that ballpark design is subject to physical constraints, as well as programmatic constraints. Yeah. And then the second thing is, is that for the housing and the retail, um, that that it should be in, there should be encouraged a multiplicity of small developments on differentiated lots uh, on a block, rather than developing one or more blocks at a time. That, yeah. is, that the bottom line is that really it just needs to be smaller scale in terms of baseball parks and smaller scale in terms of of uh, the development of individual properties as either residential or or retail. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Hey, Angie, if I could go back a moment, uh, what changes have come in route as a result of your town hall meetings with uh, the Black staff and student athletes? And can you share a little bit about the new Stand Together platform, please? Yeah. Um, it, what has really changed is the um, student athletes have taken charge <laughs> of, of this, this area. And so, you know, when I first was named, I, I felt like what I had to do was catch up with them because they had already started with action planning and, and things that they wanted to do. I am so proud to say that every single one of our teams have had conversations about social injustice and racial injustice, and then have created, you know, I, or talked to, if they haven't created a plan, they've talked about ideas of what they want, they want to do. So some have done some virtual community service things. Some have, they're reading books. They want to educate themselves. We, we made it clear that we all don't have the answer to this. I don't have the answer to this. My, ex my opinions and thoughts are based on my experience, right? And so that town hall has allowed us to to continue to talk about creating safe spaces amongst teams and um, in the department to talk about these very, very, very tough conversations. And um, we've also, just due to ACC putting out a unity statement as well, so we have that to fall back on, but our teams have um, created 
some have created like warm up shirts with their own social injustice messages that they want on them. Not what the athletics department is, you know, putting on them. Theirs, they're leading it. So that you know, if I could sum it up, they're they're leading it and um and leading the the charge uh, really really well. So be on the lookout. Swim caps will have stand together on it, um, football patch that has a uh, rally on it. So that's the wonderful thing is that they're leading it and, and we're just trying to catch up with them and help them do it the right way. The stand yeah, together allowing, initiative. Mm -hmm. Allowing for personal expression. Yes, yes. But also saying that, you know what, we won't, we won't agree, right? On, on every subject, every air, uh, statement, but can we take the time and talk about it and then step in the other person's shoes for 30 seconds or a minute, whatever, and say, you know what? I, I may not agree, but I support you. I, you're my teammate, you're my brother. I will, I, I will support, you know, support you. So it's been, um, there's been some really tough conversations, but it's also been so amazing to watch our coaches and our teams lead us in this, in this time. Thanks, Angie. Hey, Kara, you wrote an uh, opinion piece for the website, The Hill, and pose the following questions. Modern sports are at a crossroad. Should we maintain the status quo, knowing the performance enhancing drug use is widespread while only occasionally punishing a handful of transgressors? Or should international agencies work to eliminate doping entirely? Given what you know about our society and the community that we live in, what needs to change so that doping is truly eliminated, not only here in the US, but internationally as well? Yeah, so first let me say, I don't think I ever saw in my career having the opportunity to start an article with a Rocky IV reference and even a montage in Rocky IV. It was basically a dream come true. Uh, so I was delighted to be able to write about that and have a little bit of fun with it too. Uh, and one thing I always like putting in context is that performance enhancing drugs are nothing new. Uh, performance enhancing drugs, we have evidence from like 700 BC of people using strychnine, yes, rat poison, as a form of uh, performance enhancing drugs. So this is not a new problem. Um, the, the new problem is, or I guess I should say the more modern problem is how very, very widespread it is and how terrible we are at actually catching, like you say, the transgressors who are doing this uh, to have a... Uh, an, an unnatural advantage over other competitors. I, I think there needs to be a massive overhaul and, and cleaning of house of these international bodies that are doing the testing, especially for Olympics or any other global sports competition. Uh, we have seen evidence now of massive corruption of folks getting paid off, tests getting thrown out, results not being reported, uh, and it's intentional. Uh, we also see uh, evidence of state-sponsored doping. Uh, I don't think doping is going to go away anytime soon. I think it is a massive arms race to find new drugs that won't be detected uh, as much as possible. And the, the science to trying to catch those folks is always behind and running to catch up and can never quite be there. Uh, however, I, I think there need to be much tighter regulations on how the, the testing procedures are actually done because it seems that corruption has run rampant within WADA and the other um, governing bodies of, of international sports so that folks are getting by all the time without being caught for doping. Yeah, great. Uh, Philip, let me kind of go back to facilities for a minute, if I may. In your opinion, are U.S. stadiums becoming too commercial with branding and advertising? Uh, are they different here in the U.S. than in stadiums abroad? And has COVID impacted stadium use differently here in the U.S. versus other regions of the world? Um, I, I can't really speak to um, the uh, the international conditions. Uh, it's just it's just not something that I've that I've followed um, that closely. But I want to say that with respect to um, professional sports in the United States, and and with with respect to baseball in particular, it's 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 always entailed in stadium advertising, right? As a as a source of of revenue, and um, uh, I've always thought that it was kind of cool that in the old urban neighborhood baseball parks that, that I've studied in more detail, that the advertisements were often uh, completely local, right? So the, like in Ebbets Field, there was a famous sign that said, you know, Abe Stark, uh, you know, haberdashery, hit the sign, win a suit, um, you know, that kind of thing. And, and um, uh, which of course is not how it is today, right? I mean, all of the, the advertisements are for, you know, for pro products, uh, you know, that are sold on a global scale. Um, but from a fan's point of view, and, and 
given the necessity of in-stadium advertising, which doesn't bother me in principle, I want to say that the only thing that I really lament um, are the, the, uh, the, the corporate name changes, right, that, that come um, from the sale of, of naming rights to stadiums. Um, but even more, uh, especially uh, having to sit within direct sight of Jumbotron TVs, uh, primarily because um, they are so mesmerizing and so unavoidable, and which is precisely the reason that, that teams want to have them, um, is that they're mesmerizing and unavoidable. But, but the problem for me is that ultimately they detract attention, including my attention, from the game. And, and I, I can't think that I'm, I'm alone in that. And so, I, you know, it, it may be necessary. I don't know what's necessary. But, but uh, for me, it's, that's, that's the most objectionable aspect of, of where stadium, in-stadium advertising has gone today. Thank you. So we got about nine minutes left, and I'd like to get a bit of discussion. So each of you looks at today's world from a different vantage point, and you've seen considerable changes throughout your careers, especially during these days where we wrestle with COVID and its impact. For the next few minutes, I, I'd just like to ask each of you to reflect based upon what you have seen, what gives you hope, what gives you concern about the near and longer term as we consider the future of sports. Kara, maybe can we start with you, please? Yeah, absolutely. I think I'd like to talk maybe not on a global scale, but here on a local scale at Notre Dame, I think when it comes to sports that it's it's time that our academic excellence match our athletic excellence. And we have reached a critical mass of faculty at Notre Dame in which developing and, and building an institute of sports studies, I think would be a fantastic way for us to not only boost our already stellar academic standing in the world, but also our athletics. We could have excellent synergy across disciplines on our campus. We could have sports management, uh, architecture, exercise science coming from my view. And we have plenty of historians, American cultural studies, and we have a culture anthropologist coming on board as well who study sports from all of these dis different vantage points that could you know, not only boost uh, our already fantastic athletic teams and you know, getting much better, more detailed studies across the board, uh, but I think it would also be a big boon to, to enrollment. I think such a program would get lots and lots of students coming in for that kind of major, having a very integrative approach to sports studies. Um, and I, I think we could have a world-class sports institute right here at Notre Dame campus. I think you're right, Kara. And I think, uh, I know that I'd love to have my sports management class be a part of that, but uh, there's a great sports and uh, ethics in sports in the business school, uh, mm -hmm. analytics in sports, analytics becoming such a critical part of it. And I help with uh, eight different teams in recruiting and probably at least one third of one, one uh, half of the students or prospects I talk to want to ask them what, what they want to study. They say, oh, I really want to get into something in sports management. So I'm going to support your efforts to make that happen. Yeah. And it's the kind of thing that can also support our athletes as well, especially those who are considering going pro. That, those are, you know, uncharted territories for, for young folks coming out of these collegiate teams, entering a very different world uh, and having a centralized location with, with a broad research base, I think could really help provide them resources to be more successful once they leave college. Angie, those things that give you hope and those things that give you concern in the future? Sure. Um, Kara, sign me up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the things that give me hope with regards to, um, to from, from the COVID perspective is oh, it has uh, made us be more creative, right? We, we now have to be out of our, get out of our comfort zone. We have to stop talking about doing things the way we used to do them and, and be flexible and, and be, um, think at a higher level. Um, if, if I can move that COVID pandemic to the social injustice piece as well, because that's a pandemic as, as well for us right now, is that it's not just, it's just not blacks, it's just not, you know, people of color, everyone is, when you look at marches and conversations, everyone's engaged now, right? Everyone is trying to figure this, figure this things out. So that brings me, that brings me hope. Um, what we're doing on Notre Dame's campus, there's more departments now that have a diversity and inclusion council who are coming together to try to talk and make changes at Notre Dame. Not that we weren't doing it before, but I just feel like there's more of an intentionality um, as we try to, to, to make change now. So that brings me hope. Um, 
the second part with regards to, to my fears um, is, is probably more than mental, the mental aspect of us all not being able to be together. Um, the economy, you know, folks are worried about jobs and furlough and their families and, and those who are single, who, who are alone, right? And we're all virtual now. So um, just hoping that we can get through this pandemic, you know, a little sooner than, than later. Philip, your thoughts? Well, I want to I want to add uh, uh, my appreciation for Kara's suggestion, and uh, <laughs> uh, in particular, and 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 uh, you know uh, Angie as well. The 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 dilemmas of of um, the the way that the virus um, uh, keeps us apart in so many ways uh, is is obviously a concern. But I, what I was thinking of in particular, though, is uh, is that the thing one of the things that gives me hope um, is that the virus. Uh, has, uh, I, I think with respect to sports, but also I think with respect to life in general, it requires of us to live uh, at a smaller scale, um, at a more local scale, at a more participatory kind of scale. And so, so I imagine that, um, that, you know, I mean, what I've seen, and it's certainly been a part of, a part of my own life since, um, um, since, since COVID hit, um, is that, you know, people are making efforts uh, to get together, even though we have to maintain distance, right? And and in sports, it's harder to maintain distance, right? When you're when you're involved in participatory sports, but it's also the case again that the demographics are such that I that I have hope for uh, for younger people, and I know you know I also know a lot of people um, you know my own age and you know adults who are you know more statistically at risk in COVID. You know we find ways to get to the golf course. We find ways to get to the, to the gym. We find ways to, you know, get out and, and be riding, you know, bicycles. My understanding is that bicycle sales have boomed, uh, you know, since, since the advent of, of COVID. And, and, you know, part of that is you're out in the fresh air and, and there was anxiety at first about how, you know, how it's actually caught. But I think, I think we know now a little bit that, that, that you're relatively safe outside in the open air with masks at distance and that you can exercise. And, and I think that all of this will find its way, eventually work its way down so that sports and again, life itself will be lived at a, at a smaller and more, more local and communal scale. I think what gives me concern about um, the um, sports in particular is my fear that be, because it's such a big business and there's so much at stake that, that there's going to be a lot of effort made to try to save it at the scale at which it currently exists. And if it's saved um, at that scale, it's inevitably going to become the domain of the wealthy. Um, I really worry about the extent to which, uh, uh, particularly with respect to facility, sports facilities, that, that they continue to be funded, uh, you know, by, they continue to be built by public financing. Um, there's less of that going on these days, but it's it's making a comeback. You know, a lot of the, you know, even the, the stadiums that, um, um, you know, that were mentioned earlier that are, you know, coming in at a billion dollars. Some of it's privately funded, but a lot of it is, is uh, a lot of that is infrastructure costs. You know, maybe more than 50% or something will be land acquisition and, and infrastructure costs that are, that become public expenses. And that, I think that's, that's just a losing game. That is just going to, to hasten um, the decline of, of local economies. And, and so sports has to become, pro, pro sports has to become, you know, more of, a, of an accountable uh, business with respect to its, its place in the community. Okay. So Mary Helms wanted to make a comment uh, for you, Angie, and that is, thank you for supporting and encouraging Irish athletes as they use their platform to speak out on these important social issues. And then a follow-up question from Josh, Josh Burlo is, how are you providing additional mental health support for your student athletes? We've seen that as a challenge with our teens, as well as establishing team culture without traditional um, interactions. Your thoughts? Mm -hmm. um, so what we, we have a couple of sports psychologists that are on our staff that work with UC as well on, on um, campus. And so they are sending out resources um, constantly of where to go if, if you're having issues, um, uh, techniques to get out and work out or eat well, make sure you're sleeping. Um, and then um, student, our student athletes, our student athlete advisory committee, which we call SAC, uh, mental health has been their main platform for a while now. And so they get together as student athletes and, and focus on ways to 
make sure that there's programming for them, there's support from the, for them in that in that area as well. That's great. Um, Philip, I want to bounce back to you if I may. Don Genocchio, uh, who uh, was a wonderful SAP representative on campus here, has got a question for you. Any current studies or data about 2020 economic impacts to stadium communities, including hourly employees, local hospitality, industries, or small businesses uh, dependent on stadium business? So uh, I don't know of any you know, particular statistical um, studies and, 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 uh, and data in that regard. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that they exist. Um, my conjecture, just basing on, you know, again, what I know from experience, it, it's impossible that, that there's not a huge adverse impact um, on stadium employees. Uh, in sure. particular, that's seasonal work um, when there are no fans in the stadium. Um, you know, people who work in concessions, uh, people who work in, in cleanup, and unless a team unless a team is is subsidizing those employees, and there may be some that are, uh, but but if they're not, I mean, they're taking a a, a real hit um, on this, and and that's certainly true um, with respect to um, uh, ballparks that are integral to their neighborhood and their city. I mean, there's just a huge number of of businesses around Fenway Park, businesses around. Uh, around Wrigley Field in particular, that 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 simply w cannot be doing as much business as they would be doing uh, with um, you know with forty thousand people in the neighborhood eighty times a year. Um, uh, so I so I don't um, statistically I don't know, but I can't imagine that it's not having an adverse impact. And and this is going to continue to reverberate. You know, it's it's one of the problems about the future of of uh, of in stadium sports. Yeah, I think it not only engages in sports, but just think about the entertainment industry and, and Broadway being dark again and the, the mayor and the governor having to conclude that now Broadway is going to be dark until May 31st of next year. And all those restaurants and small business and stuff that have relied on that business, uh, you take that and multiply that times all the different major cities that we have in the world. So the final question that I've actually got from our audience, those viewing at home, is from Mike Hogan. And again, it's for you, Philip. Um, can you comment on the role IT information technology in the stadium planning process, please? Uh, the connected fan and the fan experiences are driving increased IT needs to serve the fan and the business of running the stadium. Can you comment on that, if you would, please? Boy, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I have anything illuminating to say about that, except that obviously uh, I, I'm not I'm not surprised that it would be happening. Uh, I mean, uh, teams have become quite sophisticated in uh, in terms of of targeting um, their their fan base and keeping in touch with their fan base. Um, but I'm I'm not up on I'm not up on the latest tech um, in in how that's being done. Okay. Any I, I don't know if there was any other questions that would come in, but. Um... Uh, let's just see if there's anything else I can see there. Not that I can see. So I'd just like to maybe kind of bring it to with the, just a few minutes here. I'd just like to maybe kind of get your final thoughts about, you know, we've had a chance to chat about this over the past 50 minutes or so, but as you look forward, I know you talked about your hopes and the concerns, but where do you see the world being in sports one year from now? Kara? Oh, the world of sports one year from now. Um, I know the financial burden is great. However, if, if we are still living with the pandemic a year from now, uh, I would like to see more institutions trying to adopt the NBA and NHL model. And I think that's something that Notre Dame could even do and offer to host, you know, five, six, say football teams on campus for an entire semester. Uh, and, you know, they can study online if need be and develop a most excellent rivalry amongst themselves as they rotate round robin uh, through our amazing stadium. Uh, I, I, I think youth sports are going to take the biggest hit uh, because they don't have the financial resources that a Notre Dame does or an NBA or an NHL. Uh, and I think there are going to have to be much more creative ways in which uh, we get uh, adolescents moving uh, and physically active. Even if it's not team sports, we're going to have to be much better about uh, finding creative ways to to be healthy uh, because right now between the mental and the physical stress that we are all undergoing and the restrictions that we are all under, um, health is not doing well, whether you have COVID or not. Uh, and so I think we need to start getting some very creative critical thinkers uh, when it comes to making policies and when it comes to developing these plans to implement at grade school, high school and collegiate levels um, so that we can 
feel integrated and be healthy, uh, but also not put ourselves at greater risk. Yeah, I think coming off of that, I certainly agree with you about youth sports. And I want to put a plug in for an organization that was started here on campus in 2006 called playlikeachampiontoday.org. Started by Clark Power. He's been a professor since I think 1982. And what they do is they go around to local schools and train the parents, the coaches, and the kids about how to do it the right way, how to really play like a champion, how to have the right discipline, how to have the right. And they're they're you know they're in the process. They're a nonprofit, totally self-funded. So uh, if you've got an interest in helping do this at the youth level, because their funds are going to be limited, please check out playlikeachampiontoday.org. Angie, your thoughts. Where do you think things are going to be in a year or so? I think we, for most institutions, will still be trying to dig out of the hole that they are, that they'll be in from not having football or not being able to have fans in in the, um, in the stadiums or arenas. Um, I think if the pandemic is still here, we'll have to be more creative with recruiting. Just to Kara's point of being able to see these at uh, these uh, high school athletes, because right now we can't go out, you know, from NCAA rule, we can't go out and, and recruit and watch them. So we have to be creative and try to do it vir uh, virtually. So there's going to be a lot of changing. If we're still in the pandemic, changes to how we recruit the legislation, the requirements, what you can and cannot send to a, a prospect, we're going to have to rethink that. We won't be able to, to operate in the same manner that we're doing now. And we're kind of piecemealing it right now. Let me hand the ball off to you, Philip. Your thoughts, sir? So I think with respect to professional sports in here um, and, and beyond, uh, that it's going to depend a lot uh, upon the strength of, um, you know, of television revenues uh, mm -hmm. and those contracts. And uh, because they're, they're providing a huge uh, amount of income. Um, and again, I don't know the exact statistics, but I, I would not be surprised if it's not actually more than what's generated by, by fan um, you know, in stadium attendance. But the question is even, you know, how long that can continue uh, in an economy, you know, that, that continues to be affected by COVID, you know, throughout, right? This sort of um, systemic uh, e economic uh, set of problems that, that are, are related to the pandemic. And so um, I certainly don't expect that to continue um, well uh, over an extended period of time. Uh, if, if COVID extends over an extended period of time. And so, uh, so I would expect um, a certain kind of shrinkage uh, in, in the scope of professional sports. I think with respect to youth sports, the, I think that actually, uh, again, it, this is one of those situations where the people who have resources um, will be able to uh, uh, make uh, youth sports available to their children and will make uh, every effort to do it. And that those who don't have resources uh, will be hurt by that. Um, and that what I would hope will happen in those circumstances um, is, is kind of what um, American society at its best has always done, right? That we form associations and we, we try to, um, uh, you know, engage, uh, uh, you know, people who have means try to engage people who, who don't have means and try to, you know, bring them into a common enterprise that, uh, that we all benefit from. I'm sure that that will happen. I think that the question is kind of at what scale uh, it will happen. And I hope it's at a larger scale rather than a smaller scale. Yeah, I would just also say that that play like a champion today.org that I mentioned, they have yep. a particular focus on inner city youth, lower income, young people that just do not have the resources or access, access to, you know, uniforms and team sports and everything. And they're part of the, the, the Michiana Athletic Recreation Association and really just doing wonderful work. So yep. as we take a look forward, I uh, really want to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I learned some stuff today. I learned some stuff every day, but I learned a lot more today than on most days. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, we want to particularly thank our panel, as well as Think ND and Mary Scott and her team and staff and the Alumni Association for hosting this series. So next week, we're going to have a chance to hear from a national viewpoint from three of my who people who have become friends and associates um, about what's going on at the level of actual people running businesses. So we're going to be featuring with Allison Barber, who's president and chief operating officer for the Indiana Fever WNBA. Uh, the WNBA team was able, WNBA was able to pull off their season uh, in a bubble as well, just like the NBA did. She's a really interesting lady. She's had eight different careers. This is her eighth and her favorite career. 
She's worked in Iraq in the war zone. She's run, started a university. Really interesting lady. I think you'll enjoy hearing from her. And then we're going to have a chance to hear from somebody who owns a facility, who owns sports teams. So Raul Fernandez is co-chairman and owner of Monumental Sports. So they own the WNBA, sorry, the NBA Washington Wizards, the WNBA Washington Mystics that won the NBA WNBA championship last year, and the NHL Washington Capitals that won the Stanley Cup last year, among other teams. Uh, they also own a property, the Capital One Arena in DC, uh, whose, you know, that the revenue from the entire corporation is based on putting people in the seats. So you'll get a really neat perspective from, uh, from a company that really is very engaged and very unique in America. They also own minor league fan franchises and cities. And, you know, if you think about the minor leagues, the minor league baseball uh, season was completely canceled this year. So Joe Hart from the South Bend Cubs, a really interesting guy is trying to think about well, how do I bounce back and get people back in the seats? And then at the college level, there's a lot of challenges. So former Notre Dame basketball player and current NCAA executive, Stan Wilcox, He's the executive vice president for regulatory affairs. Stan played here from 78 to 81 uh, and then went on, got his law degree, uh, got into the Big East Conference, uh, had a conversation with Missy Convoy and ended up at Notre Dame uh, doing some things and then uh, became an assistant coach, then became athletic director at Florida State University, where they won a national championship in football and other sports, but importantly, where the average GPA at Florida State increased to the highest level ever, understands leadership, and Stan now is down in Indianapolis at the NCAA office. So please feel free to share the series with your friends. We're accepting registrations throughout the entire program as each meeting is going to stand alone. So we hope you enjoyed this first installment of Where Are We Going in Sports, and we hope you'll spread the word and join us next week as well. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Yep. Thanks to everybody. Bye-bye. God bless. And thank you to our panel. Thank you, Chris.